quote. Um, so she, we went back, uh, this is a long story, so I'm going to try to keep it short. The, uh, Sammy and I went back east at her, at her family's home just outside of Chicago and had uh, uh, a Christmas dinner, or I should say Christmas time dinner with the family and flew back. Then she was coming back to L.A. And in Hollywood, downtown L.A., every person you could think of in the press was waiting for that train to pull, because she came back by train, was ready to pull in to the station and see Sammy and everybody get off. What they didn't think about was that that train stopped in Las Vegas first. That's where we were going to pick up the train, and did. Mm -hmm. That's a whole story in itself, which I won't go into. But they didn't think that the train stopped in San Bernardino before it went into Los Angeles. We got off in San Bernardino. I rented a car and we drove back to Vegas. And when the, when the train pulled into L.A., everybody was waiting. Loyola, they were all there. But they didn't get to nothing see but thing. Kim. Nothing but Kim got off. Right. Cut off the train. Well, so the upshot was certain powers that be knew and didn't take kindly to it and decided to do something. Exactly, uh, Cohen who was the owner of Columbia Studios, ran Columbia Studios, mm -hmm. was not a, really a nice guy to begin with, and was mob affiliated with to on the uh, outskirts. And they, Kim had just finished doing Vertigo. That was a major motion picture. Mm -hmm. And uh, he didn't want this little black guy messing with his movie star. How dare, and, and all the proper language was used. All the N-words were used, I assure you. He put out a hit. On and, both of you. Uh, well, yeah, it, there's a reason why it's both. Whatever happened to Sammy would happen to me because thus comes my shadow because Sammy always used to call me that. Mm, right. But that started in Vegas and was given, given me that response. I was, that responsibility was put upon me by the mob at the Frontier Hotel when Sammy broke his first door down and left his, because he, he wasn't allowed to stay there and he used to hang out in my room because I could stay there. He said, let's go have something to eat, and he walked into the casino. Oh-ho, big barrier, uh, major no-no with the mob. No blacks. No blacks, casino. absolutely not. Couldn't stay, couldn't live there, let alone right. walk into the casino or go to have dinner. You could play, this, play the room for them, but you that, couldn't stay in the that's hotel. That's exactly how he broke the door. Right. And I'm going to, let me carry this story a little further. When he went and hit the casino, he was mobbed. Not because he was black, because he was the star of the show. Sure. So with the autographs and this and that, we spent our time in between the first and second show signing autographs and talking to people. So Sammy looked, he said, oh, it's time for the second show. So he had to go back. And as he walked by, a guy, hey, Sam, come on over here, roll a dice with me just one time, please, for luck. And so, and so he rolled a dice. He happened to win for the guy, by the way. We walked back and Sammy went into the dressing room. Will Maston jumped on top of him and me, but on top of him like a sledgehammer. Because Will is from the old school. Right. Don't so, cross that barrier. Don't cross that line. How dare you put a, excuse me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Put a, our livelihood at risk. A and, major, everything, yes. Right. Everything at risk. And Sammy just, that was it. That was the straw. Right. And uh, they had a heck of an argument. And uh, Sammy was crying, and he just walked out of the dressing room, slammed the door, came to my room, and he was still crying. And he wasn't in my, we weren't back in my room five minutes and it was a knock at the door and it was the uh, head of the hotel the man hotel manager and the head of the casino and casinos control the hotel it's not the hotel's own control of sure. casinos it's vice versa and it was all mob run. it's all mob all yeah. mob but that was the best time in vegas sure. really it was so they brought him oh, how dare you sammy sammy said look I'll, I'll cut it short okay he said i'll tell you what he said this is what i want i want to be able to stay in this hotel with my family, if I'm working in this hotel, and I want to be able to walk in the front door of this hotel. But I'll tell you what, you go over to my dressing room, you tell my dad and my uncle to get ready for the second show, because they're going to do it. I'm not. Mm -hmm. Well, these guys were really taken in the back. How dare you talk to the mob, people like that. And, and he was very polite about it, and his language was very proper, but he just wasn't going to show up. They agreed to that. They said, that well, you, busted down the door. You could do the... this, you can do that, but you can't do this, you can't do that. And they put, and they, they, they know who you are. And they said, and you, Mr. Silver, you make sure that he doesn't. And he says, oh, don't worry about him. He's my shadow. He because he right. used that all, 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 right. all of his life. 
And that's how it started, and right. that's where the first door for black performers to be able to stay at the hotel right. in the state of Nevada. Right. And so that's why the association was in, the hit would involve both. The of hit. Them. So the hit went out because of the relationship. We right. will we'll jump back to that now. The hit went out, and they tried to reach us mm -hmm. in Vegas. And Sammy and I were off doing something. I don't know what, but we mm -hmm. weren't there. Sam Senior used to fly in when he was played there. He used to play the he used to play the horses. Love uh, Hollywood track was open, mm -hmm. and um, Will Masson couldn't be found, but uh, Mickey Cohen, mm -hmm. who anybody yeah. knows who Mickey yeah. Cohen was, the gangster big, out here, knew the hit was out. Saw Sam Senior, told him Sam Senior reached Will, and Will finally got a hold of Sammy, you know, mm -hmm. it's not that we're, we're all in the same city, right. and uh, told him. And he had 48 hours in which to marry a black girl or right. in the desert, both your knees broken and your other eye put out. Right. That means you and Arthur. They didn't say me, but right. that means both, because they knew I would protect him if anybody sure. came with me. I, what chance would I have? So he ended up marrying a, a black woman in order to get the... Uh, as a business mm -hmm. deal. Right. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Okay. It's a fascinating story. Okay. So now you guys formed a company around this time because Sammy really wanted to be a movie star more than anything. And this was one, it, despite what a talent he was, he could do everything, but he wanted to be a movie star. So you guys formed Sam Art Enterprises in order to further that. So why don't you go into that a bit? We, uh, we form, formed Sam Art Enterprises first for to do whatever we could do to do money on the side other than what, what the trio was earning because the mob had a lot of control of their money at this point, mm -hmm. which is not a good place to be in. So this way they couldn't. It was our business on the side and whatever we made. And um, we tried We tried very hard to do that. And then Sammy finally okayed one of the projects. I won't go into the other stories. Mm -hmm. You know there are several stories attached sure. to this. But we formed, we formed Sam Art Enterprises, which I still own to this day. I have the business license. As a matter of fact, a photograph of the business mm -hmm. license there in 1968. Right. Uh, I'm sorry, in 1958. Right. And uh, we still have the company to this day. Right. Okay. So now, um, now Sammy Davis was very much involved, as we have already talked about, breaking down color barriers. So let's go to the Kennedy era, 1960, and his civil rights type of political activity with Sinatra and Kennedy and yeah. let's go through some of that. When when Kennedy was running for president, Frank had asked Sammy to like join the Kennedy Club, if right. you will. And mm -hmm. of course Sammy, like many people, fought a lot of Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And whenever there was a performance or something that he could help with the benefit he would right. gladly fundraisers do, gladly do so. Mm -hmm. And it so happened that it was the last um uh no, yeah, but and by this time, Sammy was now a an established. Oh yeah, oh yeah, huge yeah, we, star. We, we, we just took a big, right. big leap. We did, in we did. We should clarify that from yeah, between. Yeah, we just this, took a big leap. Yeah, in, years. For, in the late fifties, he became his own real big star in oh, a yes. big way by himself. You're right. So and by nineteen sixty, he is a household name. He's friends with Sinatra. Sinatra helped him out during his some of his early years. And so now we have this whole 1960 kind of watershed era for the U.S. and uh, for civil rights. Right. So Sam, he, we, Kennedy was doing his last big benefit before the election. Mm -hmm. And Frank had asked Sammy to come back and appear before them. And Sammy was in Australia. And the thing was in New York. And the only way Sammy could get to New York from Australia and be there on time was to fly the what I would say the wrong way around the world. Mm -hmm. He had to race the sun. He actually got there. He flew from Australia through Europe and around that mm -hmm. way rather than coming across this way. And he got to 15 minutes before he was supposed to do something. He did the benefit and everything and everything was rah, rah, rah. Then came time, Kennedy was elected, came time for the inaugural ball. And Sammy certainly expected to be invited and was disinvited by Frank Sinatra. He had to tell Sammy this, mm -hmm. but it came from Kennedy's father. He didn't want, and I'm quoting now, didn't want any niggers hanging around the Kennedy family. 
I didn't want to use that word, but this is, has to be used. Well, Joe Sr. was certainly a hard character. Yes, a very hard character, and, and a little mobbish himself. Absolutely. And um, so Frank had to tell Sammy. Sammy was so brokenhearted over this, mm -hmm. he didn't speak to Frank for a year and a half, which led to the thing with Sammy hu hugging, if you will, kind of grabbing from behind, grabbing his arm, Nixon. It Who had was, lost the 1960 election. Which, are, which, which, you know, people in show business are touchy-feely people. Mm -hmm. We always are. We, that's right. the way we are. It, there was nothing personal about it, but it got Sammy a little bit more into a kind of a shot back, right? if he could, which then developed, then developed into the, the, the Martin Luther King era right. was starting up, and Sammy was very much into that because he had pushed down so many doors already he knew very well how to push him down, right? And absolutely. push him down against the white, or white world, quote quote. Right, absolutely. Well, Sinatra got his own comeuppance from the Kennedys when uh, Robert Kennedy refused to let John Kennedy stay at Sinatra's Palm Springs house, which which, which brings us around to the Rat Pack. If you right. Want to so know, now yeah. we can jump ahead to the mid '60s with his involvement uh, now with the Rat Pack, which is of course Joey Bishop, Dean Martin, Frank Sinatra. Uh, and Sammy Peter they, Lawford. and Peter Lawford, right? They all were in Ocean's Eleven together, and that was a big thing. Now, you say the Rat Pack is just a small part of his life, and of course it is. But there's always interest in it because of like who's the press, in it. like the press does, and will long after we're all gone. Mm -hmm. They take, they pick on something that is as hot today as it was then, maybe even right. hotter. And there's a cachet to it. And yes, exactly. And um, when they did Ocean's Eleven, a lot of people don't know this: that the movie Ocean's Eleven was only shot in Vegas, a very small piece of the movie. Oh, right. The rest of it was shot in Hollywood on the soundstage, mm -hmm. and only the exterior shots were shot in, in there. While they were doing that is when the group was performing at the Sands, and right. you never knew who was going to be there on any given night right. while they were there. Um, and those films are famous. Oh, they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're famous, but, right. the, but some very sad things happened. The, Frank's made some very negative remarks to Sammy off stage mm. or through the microphone right. and you know that's all in the book that hurt Sammy very very deeply but he he, he didn't took it he, he took it there but he didn't take it back in the room right and I got I was so mad at him for letting him do that see right. I was ready to take on Frank he, he, Frank doesn't bother me because Frank was a good friend to me he did nice things for me he never, right. we never had any problems but they only appeared together three times that was the one time the second time was at the Fairmont right the, the, I mean, in Florida at the Fountain Blue, right. there was only and there was only three of them. Cause right. We, we lost, the, the, and then what you just mentioned, up of when Frank wanted to buy into Calneva Lodge. Oh which, yeah, which he wasn't allowed which, to do. Which which he tried to do, but but his connection with Gene Connor right, that would, wouldn't let that, it happen. And yeah. then it was just Frank, Dean, and Sammy were going to right. appear there that for the right. takeover. Right. Okay. So let's now. There's also the My Brit story. He ended up marrying my Brit, and she was from right. Sweden. Yes, right. And so uh, by that time, it was uh, it wasn't as controversial because now we're talking the mid '60s, and it was it was controversial, but it was okay. No, it, it was wasn't. not okay. Okay. Uh, uh, my Brit was a movie star in her own right. Her mm -hmm. last movie was with Marlon. Started with Marlon Brando. She's a pretty big star in her own and right. And this is probably about 1965, 66. I you know, it's hard to remember right. back of the long time, but yeah, but it was whenever, right. you know, it's, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, at any rate, um, they met, and it's, I won't go, because some of the story is pretty funny, but Sammy did this very formally. Now, now we're going to separate the Kim Novak romance to a My Brit romance. <laughs> right. We're separating a... Ten years and a different era. No, it wasn't even ten years between. But we're, we're separating. No, we're separating the kind of love that went okay. between the two people. Right. Because my Brit, it was an entirely different person. She gave up her career. Right. She, uh, you know, married Sammy. They had a child. Well, he had three. He adopted mm -hmm. two. She, but she, which she raised all three. Because when she, Sammy was never a stay-at-home dad. Never would be. Never could right. be. In, you know. In How long life. were they married? Huh? How long were they married? Oh boy, there's a good question. Uh, I don't know. I think it was maybe five years or something. Right. I really, I, I, if I'm not accurate about that, I'm not sure because I never, I kind of pulled away from the picture just after the baby's. Oh no, the baby was born. Uh, right, because I know in the. 
it, in the late 60s, Sammy started getting into drugs to a certain degree. And I, then I know you guys separated uh, from each other because you saw what was swirling around him. The people around him were so bad for him. And, and then you ended up separating from like in the, in the early 70s. Yeah, it's, it's, it, was a, it was a sad day. Mm -hmm. uh, I was actually fired by the mob, which is that story people should read about. It's kind of interesting. And then Sammy called me back uh, about four years later when he was able to when he wasn't under th that much control of them. Right. Uh, he still was, but he was able to, and I was I was brought back into the fold. But by that time, he had gone through, you're, you're right, the mm -hmm. drugs, the Nehru jackets, the, the, right. the TV shows, and all the rest of the bad stuff in his right. life. Right, here come the judge, and yeah, they laughing. He, he, laughing, yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is, is a whole new thing. And when I came back, our relationship was the same, but, uh, that would never change. Right. Never, never did change, except that he was in such a funk. Right. He moved. He was couldn't go into the streets. That's why he took up gourmet cooking. A lot of people don't know that. Right. He carried the entire kitchen with him on the road wherever uh -huh. he went and cooked every night. Right. And well, and a lot of them, even like they they were less popular in the late sixties because of the whole Vietnam era, yeah, exactly. and their style of music was less popular. Even Sinatra had trouble. Yes. In the late yes, 60s. He did. Yes, he did. And so that played in also probably to the drug use. Yeah, well, whatnot. your mind is not in the place because Sammy is very hip to keeping up. And well, right. not that Sinatra wasn't hip, he wasn't the no. hippest guys in the world. But, uh, you know, you're right. It, it, it did take a drop off mm -hmm. before it started to come back. Right, come when back there was up. a nostalgic come, uh, come back up comeback. Come exactly. Back up and uh, the movies, the, mm -hmm. he went into the movies and so on and so forth. Um, if we have enough time, I'd like to tell you about Sammy and the guns. And this well, what, let's. I think we've covered just about your whole ex existence with him. Why don't you finish up by giving us two or three of your favorite funny stories of Sammy? Okay, the one was Sammy always did the um, in his show because he wanted to be a cowboy. That was another thing. Big movie buff of western film, and we started with the guns. Now this started actually in a place called Apache Junction, Arizona, which this is where Superstition Mountain is, by the way. And people in show business don't have much to do then, especially in Apache Junction, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, to do in the daytime. So our favorite thing is, is it runs all. It's the theme that runs through the book is, we would go window shopping, and we walked by a store that sold guns, and Sammy, all of a sudden, we were into guns. He'd go in and bought everything to do with guns. This is where the fast draw thing started with Sammy and I both. And uh, well, now we've got the guns. What do we do with them? We well, we want to shoot them, of course. We're talking about forty Colt forty fives. Mm -hmm. And so we talk. I talked to the manager of the hotel we were playing, uh, the nightclub we were playing in, and he sent over his guy, an Indian, a real, a real Indian. His name was Joe. I can't remember the last name, but his name, the first name was Joe. He was going to take us out to his ranch. And he was going to start a shooting. And he took us out there, beautiful, nicest guy in the world, nice family, all his kids. Anyway, we had we had lunch, and he said something to his son, and they went went on off. He said, "Okay, let's let's now we're going to go out in the desert." So we walk out. He says, "Come on." Sammy started to just walk out into the open desert. He said, "No, no, 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 come with me." And we went to, we went into the stable, and the son had put saddles on on these horses, and. Uh, because we were going to ride out into the desert. Mm -hmm. Well, Sammy saw this horse. No way was Sammy going to get on a horse. No way at all. He called me everything. He called no way, no way. He's a gentle horse and so on and so forth. And skipping so he finally got him on the horse. And was really a gentle horse. And he walked around the corral a few times, a few times. All of a sudden, he's John Wayne in his head. Okay, I'm ready. Let's go. And out we went, and then the gu whole thing started with the guns, and he became very proficient at all of the trick gunnery stuff. I was a fast draw, so we used to do it by the hours with facing one another, and uh, I was faster than he was by a couple of milliseconds, but he did all the gun tricks. I never, never got, into, didn't got into that. He almost killed Joe Lewis, too, by the way. With a gun? With a gun. By accident. By accident, it's one of those things that if anybody sees this, mm -hmm. there's no such thing as an unloaded gun, right. even when you think it's unloaded. Okay, now tell. I know that you told me one story before about when he got injured on stage. That's um, okay. That's what you're getting to. Yeah, I all right, yeah. 
the uh, at the end of his act is when he did the thing with the guns. Now, we had the, the, in the 45, you can have a full load, a three quarter load, a half load, and a quarter load. So, which obviously speaks for itself. A mm -hmm. full load is really going to make a loud bang and spit fire out of the end of the gun about mm -hmm. that far. It also spits out a wad that's packed in. Each one of them does that, but of course, the bigger the bullet, the, right. I mean, the more, more powder, the bigger the wad. And so the last shot he, and he used to do it on stage, but he always fired off stage. People right. knew this for obvious reasons. Didn't want anybody to get hit by the wad, uh, and then the powder. At any rate, he was on stage. He was just getting off, and he and I was sitting on the table. Uh, we had friends at the Chichi Club in Palm Springs. And I had my arm was like this on the on the stage, and he goes for a fast draw. Now one of the tricks with fast draws is, is when you go for the gun, you actually cock it as your hand's going by while it's in the holster. And as your hand keeps moving, you're pulling the gun out and up. Well, and you're getting your hand into the trigger. Well, what happens, was it, which does happen, he got the gun about halfway out of the holster and he pulled the trigger. And he shot himself in the back of the calf of his leg with a full load. Blank. Must have been so painful. And he was, and he got, he covered it by doing his Jerry Lewis impression of mm -hmm. funny face and dancing all over the stage to get off. And he came by me and he said, I really did it this time. He had a hole this big in the calf of his pants right through his very expensive tuxedo blue, I remember. Mm -hmm. And I could see the, the blood right. starting, to, starting to come out. We had to call for a doctor right. in the house because he really shot himself in the back of the leg. And it was, it hurt a lot. Well, this has been a great uh, interview, great stories. Uh, just sum up what Sammy Davis Jr. means to you. What he means, means yeah. to me? I've asked, been asked this question several times. Outside of being my closest friend in life, not family, but well, he was family, but I mean, mm -hmm. it's, there's a relationship that men have with men that women don't understand. Uh, and never will. And never will. And um, that's that's he was my best friend, my best confidant, and I, I miss him every day, especially when I do stories. And that's what pushed me to do this book to try to straighten out some of the many miscarriages of his life. Um, I remember him as a little guy, of five foot four, five foot three, hundred and thirty pounds, that wanted really nothing more than to be equal. Not to be white, that would be, you might say, a partially given during the time period, period that we were in. He just wanted to be able to stay at the hotel, to walk through the door, to gamble at the casinos, etc., etc. And I remember the tenacity, his tenacity, when he said to me, if you do it silver, do it right. Well, that, that pretty much sums it up. That's what I'm trying to do. Thank you very much, Arthur Silver, Jr. Thank you.